and only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We still have some people signing in, so we'll give them another minute to get logged in before we begin. And as you heard when you signed in, this webinar is being recorded. We'll tell you how you can access the recording a bit later on. Okay, it looks like the logging in has slowed down, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome again, everyone. My name is Kim Brown, and I'm with the Rural Institute Transition and Employment Projects. I will be your moderator for today. Today's webinar is sponsored by the University of Montana Rural Institute Transition and Employment Projects, and it's funded in whole or in part under a contract with the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. The statements shared in today's presentation do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the department. All of the attendees are currently muted. That helps cut down on background noise so that everybody can hear the presenter. If you want to ask the presenter a question, you can type your question into the chat box that you should see on your screen. And we'll have several question and answer periods during today's presentation. We'll also have a longer question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So feel free to send those questions into chat, and when we have our question and answer times, I'll read those to our presenter. You may notice that there's a raise your hand option for asking questions on your screen. We have found that not to work very well in the past, so we, we tend to suggest that you use the chat option for asking questions instead. For those of you who requested Montana Office of Public Instruction renewal units when you registered for the webinar, we will email those to you after the session, and that can take a couple of weeks to get those out to you. You do have to have pre-registered in order to receive the OPI credit, and please note that we are currently unable to issue other kinds of attendance documentation. Today's session is being audio taped for the Rural Institute Transition and Employment Projects Resource Library, and also for the Rural Institute Pluck Online Transition Toolbox. And I'll put the addresses for both of those websites up in the chat box a little bit later on. A PDF version of the PowerPoint for today's webinar is currently posted on the Transition and Employment Projects website, and we'll add that to the online transition toolbox in the next week or so. So if you're interested in looking at or printing off the slides from today's webinar, those are currently up on the Transition Projects website. When you sign out of today's session, a short survey will pop up. I think it's about eight questions. And we ask that you please take the time to fill out that survey. We read all of the responses that we receive, and we use those for planning for our future webinars. So again, please do take the time to fill out that short survey. With that, I would like to introduce and thank our speaker today. We have Judy Shanley who is the Director of Student Engagement and Mobility Management at the Easter Seals Transportation Group. Judy provides technical assistance, conducts research, and develops informational products regarding accessible transportation for students with disabilities. She has conducted over 50 national and international workshops on building continuums of transportation service across educators, pupil transporters, and public transit professionals. Most recently, Judy developed an online curriculum for educators, families, human services professionals, and transit to facilitate knowledge and skill around coordinated transportation systems. She serves as project director of national centers funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Transit Administration, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Community Living. In these roles, Shanley manages work related to building inclusive coordinated transportation infrastructures that are responsive to the needs of people with disabilities, older adults, and others who need transportation support. And just as a quick aside, I'll let you know that Judy is in the middle of moving from one city to another, and her movers just left her home about 15 minutes ago. Um, in the midst of all of that, she agreed to still come forward and present today's webinar. So we really appreciate her, um, her willingness to do this for us and to share her knowledge and expertise. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Judy. Terrific. Thank you so much, Kim. And thank you, Ellen. And thank you to the University of Montana Rural Institute. Hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. I am, um, as 
Kim said deep in a move right now, but right now I'm coming to you from sunny Boston, Massachusetts, where it's about um, 82 degrees and low humidity, so the weather is great here. Oh, my screen is not working, Kim. My PowerPoint is not moving for some reason. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Maybe it takes us a little delay. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little about today, uh, Easter Seals Project Action. And for those of you who don't know, Project Action is accessible community transportation in our nation. Um, we'll be talking a little about transportation education and uh, the notion of transportation education. And I'll share with you some ways that you can embed transportation education in some existing school reforms that you have going on. I'll share with you also a continuum of transportation education that we've developed at Project Action um, and also highlight some examples of linkages that potentially you all can make with pupil transporters in your community. Um, we're also going to be addressing topics that are specific and unique to rural areas and um, not urban areas as many of us think about transportation as being um, predominantly in urban areas, but I'll be sharing hopefully some strategies and solutions for you to address transportation challenges in your communities. And then I'd like to have a discussion. I'd like to learn from you whenever I do presentations or discussions or workshops. I really feel like I learn a lot from the people that I'm speaking with, and so um, hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion and hearing information about what's going on in your areas. For those of you who don't know, Easter Seals Project Action, our work is really to promote universal access to transportation for people with disabilities. We support in all of our work focuses on the Americans with Disabilities Act and its tenets related to accessible transportation for people with disabilities, Title II of the ADA. We're, we've been in federal legislation funded by the Department of Transportation, the Federal Transit Administration, for over 23 years. So Project Action has a long and rich history of providing information about accessible transportation. We're a cooperative agreement between Easter Seals and the Federal Transit Administration, and our work is aligned with Easter Seals as a national organization in its work to improve the lives of children, youth, and adults with disabilities. And I hope you're all familiar with Easter Seals. We've got affiliates in every state of the U.S., and I hope you've had an opportunity to work with your local Easter Seals affiliates and find out the kinds of resources and supports that are available. I happen to be in the Washington, D.C. office of Easter Seals, which is the national office, and that's where Project Action is based. Our work is very similar to um, any federally supported technical assistance center where we provide training activities. We've got a lot of online events and webinars. We provide direct technical assistance, so you could call a toll-free number and um, ask a particular question that may be unique to your own setting. We also work with communities around the country to build coalitions around accessible transportation. We've conducted research on various topics, and we also do lots and lots of outreach. And um, one of the, the ways we do outreach is to participating in webinars such as this by the Rural Institute. So I was just curious, this is a poll that um, really I want to gauge your knowledge and use of Easter Seals Project Action materials. And um, Kim is going to open the poll, which um, has three responses. One is that you've participated in Easter Seals Project Action resources, and it's a must-have resource. Two, you've heard about Project Action, but mm, maybe not so sure about what it's all about. And three, you've never used Project Action resources, but you're so excited to learn more, and you can't wait to learn more about the events and the materials that we can offer. And so far, 56% of you have voted. So if you haven't answered the poll, get your answer up there.
We were up to 63%, Judy. All right. And what's the, the leading? We are 100%. Um, I have never used the resources. I am excited to learn more. Oh, yay! So I hope after this webinar that you'll, you'll go back to your desks and you'll call us or you'll get online and download some of our materials. We're, by the way, because we're federally supported, we're all free. The materials and the training and technical assistance that you'll find is all um, free and downloadable. So um, I'm looking forward to sharing information with you that I hope you'll find useful and useful in the future. So. I started working, I used to work at the U.S. Department of Education, and my background is as a transition coordinator. I worked in a large city school district and would set up trans transition programs between the school system and human service agencies in the community. And I worked really hard at ensuring that there was really great evidence-based practices used, that the goals that I had established for students were realistic, that plans and services in place were appropriate and student-driven. But then, when it was all said and done, I wasn't thinking about transportation. You know, if I built all these systems and I had the best goals for students, but students couldn't get to jobs, they couldn't get to higher education, they couldn't participate in the community, then it was all for naught. So when I was hired by Easter Seals Project Action about two years ago, um, they hired me as a student engagement person. And that means to help transition professionals ensure that transportation supports are part of the transition process. And my colleagues and I at the project were thinking, you know, we are a driver society. Every student, when they get to high school, they think about getting a driver's license. And our schools really are good at providing driver's education. But what if we thought about something called transportation education, which is essentially a, a culture that ensures that students all throughout grades, so I'm, I'm talking K-12 and even beyond in, in college, have information and have resources and have um, knowledge provided around transportation so that when they leave high school, when they transition to post-school settings, they've got transportation options. So the notion of transportation education creates a culture so educators have the skills, have the knowledge to be able to teach students about transportation, public transportation. Um, there's a coordinated set of practices that includes families, that includes students, that includes the yellow school bus professionals in the school district that includes public transportation so that as they transition to post-secondary settings, whether it's education, higher ed, employment, independent living, that they've got transportation supports. So the premise of what I'm sharing with you today is really based upon something called transportation education. And the um, this is a quote that one of the students we were working with shared. I feel like I'm independent. I don't need to depend upon my mom and dad to take me places. Now I can ride the bus to get to my job, to the movies with my friends. So providing students with the resources and the knowledge to use public transit in the community is really teaching them and providing them with spontaneous choice. And I've got a video here of a student that we most recently worked with. And so let me see if this works. Hopefully it will. These videos, by the way, are all on our website in a curriculum that I'm going to be introducing. Those things in the training. 
So I hope you were able to hear that, but that was a student um, from Chicago Public Schools that we worked with that was talking about how learning to use public transportation has really provided him with opportunities that he wouldn't have otherwise have learned. And I, as I said, the videos that I'm going to be sharing are all included on our website so you can download them, they're all captioned. But I wanted you to kind of get a flavor from a student about how important this makes students feel. Educators are so busy, crazy, you know, everybody's busy in their positions and in their jobs. And so the notion of transportation education suggests that we take transportation content and we embed it with existing things that are going on in schools. So it doesn't become another thing. So it doesn't become an add-on. And this makes sense because of several reasons. One, reforms already have a foundation in infrastructure. So if you're talking about college and career readiness, or you're talking about RTI, response to intervention, the framework is already there so that building in content around transportation is an easier process. Second, the reforms usually going on work around common core standards, work around college and career readiness, typically have resources devoted to them. I know that here in Massachusetts, the, the school systems have received federal money that has gone to the state that then goes to the school districts around college and career readiness. And so there are resources, there are professional development opportunities that are available, there are materials that can be available. So it, it makes it easier to acquire resources to address transportation because these resource, the reforms carry with them resources. And then the third thing which I alluded to in, um, in the beginning is that by embedding transportation content within existing reforms, that diminishes the perception of another thing and add on to the really, really busy lives of educators and transition professionals and human service professionals. I don't know if any of you have seen this model. This was, um, it's the Ready by 21 insulated pipeline model, and it was promulgated by the Ready by 21 organization. I have the URL on the slide, but what the model looks at and suggests is that to prepare for college, to prepare for post-school outcomes, it's a pipeline approach, and there's a bunch of supports that are provided all along the way, including from early childhood all the way through work and career. And some of those supports have to do with early childhood development, after school programming, civic and social work um, opportunities. But also, this pipeline suggests that things like housing are critical to, to student and individual well-being through the college and career pipeline. Financial factors are important. And in, for our perspective, they include transportation. And so recognizing that transportation supports are vital to helping students move through that college and career readiness pipeline. This probably looks familiar to you. It's um, the, a graphic that we typically see with the Common Core standards. And think about Common Core that may be going on in your own school districts regarding where you are. I think 47 states have adopted Common Core standards now. But part of that Common Core framework, there's a focus on life and career skills. There's a focus on learning and innovation skills, so things like critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity. And then there's a focus on information, media, and technology skills. So we know that Common Core is not just about academics, that these focus areas are also critical to the standards and the content that students are required to learn through Common Core. And in the next slide, um, next couple slides, I'm going to share with you some examples of how you can embed transportation content into Common Core. 
So think about other reforms that are going on or business needs. Um, I, I'm not sure if Montana is a summary of performance states, but some states have requirements of summary of performance for students. So students have to kind of put together a portfolio of their history, of their likes, of their assessment, and bring that forward when they go to post-school settings. States have requirements and districts have requirements around the OSEP Federal Performance Accountability Indicators. Vocational rehab is often judged on its closure rate. And there's also labor market needs. You know, businesses have needs to employ people. And how can they employ people if people can't get to jobs? So in all of these other reforms and these other kind of issues or topics that affect schools, Think about how transportation could be embedded in each of these. So I guess I would be interested in knowing if in your work around Common Core, for instance, if you are um, teaching life and career skills, is transportation, travel instruction ever a focus of that? Or if you're teaching um, the, the four C's, critical thinking or communication, do you ever consider using transportation as a way to teach students about critical thinking? Um, pay, um, I think there we have a poll now. I wanted you to share your um, kind of thoughts through the chat feature. And if you don't see the chat window on your screen, Look on the upper right hand side of your screen and you should see a small arrow, a white arrow in an orange box. If you click on that white arrow in the orange box, it will open up a control panel and the chat window is in that control panel. And so you can type your thoughts that you want to share with Judy right in that little window. And I will read them to her. Judy, do you want to repeat your question while folks are, are gathering their thoughts and typing? Sure. So as you're implementing school reform um, efforts like Common Core, like college and career readiness programs that may, may be in place, is transportation typically part of that initiative or not? What's your experience with integrating transportation content into other school work that you may be doing. Okay, let's see. We have one thought coming in. Um, let me open my window a little wider here so I can read it to you. Okay. Um, I am a parent of a young child with a disability and I'm very concerned about transportation. I want my son to have the ability to be independent and to be able to go where he wants to go. Transportation plays a big role in his upcoming transition program. Yep, that's exactly right. And I think you're really smart for thinking about that early. And in fact, we're going to be doing some work with the PACER Center in Minneapolis to develop some family-oriented materials. But um, you'll see, if you go online to our website and you look at the curriculum that we developed, and I'll introduce it in the next couple of slides, um, there is a whole section on student family summits, which really help families and parents be um, more informed about how important transportation is and ways that you can work with the schools to help ensure that transportation content is included. So, for instance, I've heard of go on field trips. You know, if they have experiential learning opportunities in elementary school, then instead of taking um, cars or instead of um, using a yellow school bus, that the students actually use a public bus or a public van so that they're exposed early when they're young to transportation, to public transit as an option. Um, I've also known of school systems who, as they're teaching literacy 
to students. So they're teaching students writing in elementary or middle schools. That the examples that they use focus on transportation because that way students are learning about transportation options that may be available to them early. So I think that every opportunity um, we can share with students early in their educational experience, and for educators too. One thing that I've, I've um, learned in doing this work over the years is that educators themselves don't have a lot of content knowledge about transportation. Many of them have not ever used public transit. Many of them have never used an online um, bus scheduler system. And so it's hard for them to teach students about transportation if they themselves have never used it. And that's why we developed the curriculum. The curriculum is really focused on um, teaching educators, people transportation, families, um, it's all of those folks that work with students so that they then can implement programming so that students have early and consistent experiences around transportation. So thank you for comments. It's really, I think it's, it's really important and I'm glad you're involved. Okay, and we've had a couple more come in. Um, the next comment, I taught my daughter how to ride the bus to particular destinations. I did not see this as part of her curriculum, so I took the initiative, and that's obviously from a parent. Um, transportation is important because it allows for enhanced parental engagement in education as well as allowing for independence for persons with disabilities. Yeah. Um, and then this comment is, no, if the student can ride public transportation, our college does not address this issue. Yep. Yep. There has to be, we're doing work around that kind of continuum between elementary, middle, and post-secondary education settings because um, you're right that sometimes in higher education transportation is not addressed and, you know, the, the um, whether it's coming, getting to and from a college campus or even when a student with a disability is on a college campus, it's not um, consistently addressed across higher ed institutions. But the, the point that was raised about um, teaching your own child travel instruction because the school system never did, I, I applaud you for taking the initiative and doing that. Um, and if our work can raise awareness by families to work with school systems to be able to provide travel instruction and provide transportation education, and that's what we want. There's really no mandate right now. There's no travel instruction, travel training is um, included in IDEA, but there's not any accountability provision that's, that says it has to be. So it's kind of inconsistent across school districts whether there's addressing travel instruction. So thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. And um, maybe at the end we can uh, share more. And I hope you'll reflect on some of the comments that you've offered now. I hope that as we uh, go through when I introduce you to the curriculum that you'll think about how the curriculum maybe can be used to address some of those issues that you've raised. And we did have just one more comment, um, Judy. Th there is some travel training going on when people are traveling back and forth to work experiences. It isn't always very formal. Right, right. Yeah, and um, one of the things that I hear a lot when I get calls from school districts, and it scares me a little bit, is that um, the uh, school district would say, well, we know we have to travel train um, a student, and so we're going to find someone that can travel train them without thinking about the competencies or the skills that it takes to tra travel, provide travel instruction to someone. And um, I'll share with you a resource that I think is a really valuable resource that can help you work with a school, if you're not affiliated with the school system, is to help the school system identify the competencies of the professional as they're providing travel instruction. Because not everyone can provide travel instruction. And it's um, a real, it's, it's important discipline that there needs to be some credentialing and competency around. And we have to help school systems, we have to help families and people in general make better decisions about travel instruction. So 
thank you for your comments. Those are really all um, very much related. I hope you'll see to what I'm going to share with you now. So, you know, I come from an education background and um, always thought we have to help educators and, as I said, human services and families and others really think about how do you embed this, how do you integrate transportation education into what you're teaching so that when students do leave high school, they've got the skills and knowledge to be successful to travel independently. So we developed an online curriculum, and it's free. It's available on our website. It's nine modules. And let's see. My screen is not moving again. Sorry about that. I don't know why. Sometimes there is a bit of a delay. Oh, I don't want updates. <laughs> okay, here it is. This is a, um, a, a map of what each of the modules addresses. So the first module is kind of going over what I shared with you earlier. What is transportation education? Um, why do it is the, the also included in that first model module. But also, what's really neat about the curriculum is it offers examples. It offers examples for educators and families so that they can embed this content in Common Core, so they can develop IEPs that have transportation-related goals. There's a whole section on providing travel instruction, although it's not intended to train travel instructors. It's, it's a piece that can be used in addition to other training that travel instructors should have. There's also modules on connecting to Common Core. And so we have the Common Core elements laid out, and we provide examples on how you could um, infuse transportation content in there. We provide a lot of activities. So you would go through a module, and then there's a practical piece of it where you can apply what you've learned in the module. There's also discussion questions. So if you are an educator and you want to sit with your colleagues and go through the modules, there's discussion questions and activities that you can actually apply in your own settings. And one of the things that's really important to us is that the materials be customizable. So you could download them, and there's templates, and there's sample forms that you can make your own that you can um, modify and amend to reflect the unique attributes of your venue. Really important that, that you make them your own. Um, there's also a whole section on data. I love data, and I think that you know, as you're implementing transportation education, you really need to be thinking about you know, how are you doing it, what outcomes are you achieving, and importantly, so what? What difference does this make? for students in the long run. I know that states have requirements around OSEP Indicator 14, collecting post-school outcomes. But when I checked with the National Post-School Outcomes Center, which is a federally supported project by the Office of Special Education Programs, they didn't have a good handle on the numbers of states that collect information regarding how transportation does or does not affect student attainment of post-school outcomes. So if you have any opportunity in your school districts, if you're at a university, if you're a family in a community, collect data. Um, you know, really prove the efficacy of the intervention of transportation. There's a really nice resource section, too, in the um, modules where you can download commonly referred to terms in the transportation world. So that just gives you a kind of a framework for what the transportation education curriculum looks like. I'm all about connecting silos. We, how often have we heard as educators that we're siloed? We're siloed even in our own schools between related services and general ed and special ed and school administration. So our work is really built on a foundation of a continuum of supports for students, all driven by students and families. So the whole notions of self-determination, self-advocacy, 
um, family participation and involvement every step of the way really is a catalyst for a model that supposes that educators and both rehab and workforce development are at the table and they're working with um, folks affiliated with Safe Routes to Schools. I don't know if you're familiar with Safe Routes to Schools, but it's also funded. There are projects that are provided, grant projects to states, and it, these projects look at the walking and pedestrian pathways around school buildings. They look at bicycling. You may want to check your state department to see if they have a Safe Routes to Schools program, but those grants are also funded by the Department of Tra uh, Transportation. But those folks are sitting at the table with pupil transporters and um, campus transportation professionals, if you happen to be in a higher ed setting. And then public transportation is also at the table. And these systems are interconnected. So no longer is there a disjointed approach to transportation, but you have at an IEP meeting, you may have transportation professionals sitting at an IEP meeting. And believe it or not, when I go out and speak with pupil transporters and even public transportation people, they want to be more engaged with schools. They want to be more engaged with educational systems. They often tell me they just don't know how. They don't know who to go to within the school building. They don't know how or what the message is with the school building. But if you think of public transportation, the students in schools are the future riders. So that's the future revenue for public transit. So they want to be engaged in schools. And concurrently, pupil transporters and educators who may be involved in community efforts around public transportation can really be a catalyst for change. I was working with a school district in Texas who the transition coordinator sat on a community advisory committee around transportation. So it was she and her pupil transporter, so the, the director of, of school transportation services for her district, were part of this community forum that offered input to the public transit agency in their community. And they were so informative to this community forum that the public transit agency actually changed their route, their bus route, because she had all these students who she wanted to have community-based experiences and work experiences while they were in high school. And before the route was changed, they didn't have any way of getting there. And so her participation in her work with the public transit agency was a catalyst for making those changes in the community. And, you know, um, I talk with working with a school district out in California, the pupil transporter thinks of himself as an educator. And he wants to be part of IEP and transition planning. He wants to talk with educators about the needs of students. You know, what are the functional needs of students around transportation? How can that educator help me ensure that students have the best transportation services that they get? So, um, I guess this is just a, a model that is always at the foundation of the work that we do. And it, it substantiates how all of these different groups and their related organizations on so the bottom of this graphic are the organizations that typically um, the professionals or the individuals in, within these um, sectors are members of, like the Council for Exceptional Children and the Division on Career Development and Transition, which is the organization for transition professionals. There's a National Safe Routes to Schools organization. There's a National Association for Pupil Transportation. And there's an American Public Transportation Association. So um, you know, connecting the organizations and their people is at the heart of what we do. So here is another video, and we'll see how well this works. This is from a um, regional transportation professional who helped us develop uh, the curriculum. And I don't think. Let's see if that works. I don't think it's working. Hmm. 
No, I, I apologize. This video is not working. But again, this is on the curriculum and what this gentleman, Michael Vandekreek, his message is he works from a public transit perspective. And um, too many students are coming to his agency as a transportation provider and wanting to use paratransit. And they, they want paratransit because that's the only transportation mode that students know how to use. And Michael's message is, is that, you know what, it's scary sometimes to use public transportation, but try. You know, and, and, um, and he encourages families to consider ensuring that students, their, their children, their, their students have transportation content throughout their education so that they have options, so they don't, aren't reliant on paratransit. Paratransit is um, uh, important for some individuals, but for many, um, there's least restrictive opportunities, transportation opportunities available to individuals, and that's Michael's message. Is, I'm sorry that you weren't able to um, see or listen to the video, but again, it's on the website. So in our work, we get, you know, have the greatest job about talking with tons of people about what's going on. In Chicago Public Schools, one of the things that we did is we held a family student summit. And it was a way to bring families together um, whose students had gone through a transportation education and travel instruction program. We brought those folks together with families who I think their, their um, children were probably in middle school. So they weren't yet thinking about um, using transportation for community-based instruction or work experience or post-school, but we brought people together and, and to, to learn about the advantages and the opportunities that transportation held. We also had employers there talking about how important it was to the success of their business by having students be able to use transportation independently. It was a really powerful meeting, and it was very informal, and it was low cost. We, you know, we had some snacks for families, and it just was a great opportunity for students to share their stories, for families to share their stories, and then to hear from vocational rehab professionals and transportation professionals in the community. The other thing that I've seen, and this happened in some school districts in Ohio, some of the educators and families in the community at the school district didn't even weren't even aware of the kind of transportation services available in their community. So they did a resource mapping exercise where they kind of, and, and the students actually did this. The students called local human service organizations, local transit providers to find out what transportation services were available, who the populations that the service was available for, cost, et cetera. Um, the other thing that we've seen is connections with something called United We Ride or Mobility Management. And I've got a slide at the end of the, the session here that talks about mobility management. But it's another way for you to connect with transportation-related resources, even in places where you think there's not a lot of transportation. And we know that occurs in rural areas where there may not be the, the strong transportation infrastructure that there may be in other places. And so connecting with these coordinated transportation systems becomes even more important. Some other ideas, I, I mentioned this earlier, where the elementary school teachers had used public buses for field trips. So instead of relying on the yellow school bus, they used public transit. And the public transit agency was more than happy to, to help support that travel. Embedding transportation content in curriculum, that's what our, our curriculum is all about. Um, also, I think it's important, and I say I always say this to teacher education programs, are future teachers. We want future teachers and future human services professionals to know about transportation. And so we have to be sure that while they're in school, while they're learning to be teachers, while they're learning to be related service professionals, that they learn about transportation. And then providing opportunities for professional development around transportation. So these are just some things that we've learned and strategies over time that um, are being used by school systems around the, the country. 
often the yellow school bus is the first step for students to learn about transportation. And I was working with school districts in New York State, and it was really neat. What they did was they took a yellow school bus um, and they, they tried to emulate a public bus. So they put in, a, and the, the yellow school bus was in the school lot, but they established a fare card system and they had students, they printed out fare cards and they had students learn about how to use a fare card system on a bus. They put signage from the public transit agency within the bus so that students would become familiar with the differences between a yellow school bus and a public bus. They also invited a driver to be in the front seat so students would get in the bus and they'd see this driver who was a driver for the public system in their community. They develop schedules and route maps. And think about it, if you're teaching math to students, if you're te teaching calculations and addition and subtraction, why not use a bus schedule as a way to teach that content to students? If you're teaching literacy, if you're teaching reading, why not um, introduce students to reading a route map, reading a schedule, a public transit schedule? And then these are just some of the other things that this school system had done to help students become aware of what a public bus may look like. So we think about um, integrating transportation content in IEP, and, and this, um, if, if you're educators, this will be familiar to you. The, the components of an IEP, individualized education program, include assessments, includes descriptions of student present level of performance. It includes goals and benchmarks. The transition plan becomes part of an IEP where you've got measurable outcomes. And then transportation services also could become part of that IEP. And here are some of the specific examples of goals that have been developed, and we collected these from school systems around the country where, um, you know, when in this example the student had um, goals around functional time telling, functional um, learning how to tell time using a, a map, using a schedule, a transit schedule. They also had goals related to reading and understanding signs and symbols in the community. So what does the transit sign look like? What does a stop sign look like? And then um, work around using a self-advocacy plan. Um, self-advocacy is obviously really part of IEP planning, and um, the school system had developed a student self-advocacy plan around transportation. Here's some more. We know that Common Core has a focus on technology, math, and transportation, or technology and math. So here's goals related to using the route mapping to teach technology. Many of the transit agencies, and I don't know if you've been on your own transit agency, have pretty sophisticated web-based tools that allow you to schedule transit or allow you to figure out the best route to take. So that was a way that the school taught students about technology and math by using that online system. Um, this is the requirement for transition planning, which you're probably all familiar with. Definition comes from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, the assessment piece is a critical part of transition planning, and it actually can include and should include assessment around student ability to travel independently. Occupational therapists and physical therapists can be really instrumental in collecting assessment data to inform the, the knowledge that an educator has around student capacity for transportation. Here are some post-secondary outcomes, of, or the transition plan has to include post-secondary outcomes. And here are some examples. And these exactly come from an IEP, a transition plan for students. So Andrew will independently travel to and from work using public transportation. Um, here's the second one. After completing high school and moving to college, Michaela will utilize campus transit options to attend her weekly classes. So as transition plans are implemented and students um, have post-secondary outcomes, why not include those outcomes not only related to where the student is, but transportation goals. 
A course of study is also an important component of a transition plan. And here's examples of some course of study. Um, this one, the first one is the um, a high school offers a colloquium course and it focuses on post-secondary planning for all students and there's community-based instruction. Well, as part of that community-based instruction, the to address course of study, the student had to use transportation to attend community-based instruction. The transition plan also, and, and um, transition coordinators know this, need to include a coordinated set of activities. And here's some examples of coordinated set of activities. Job shadowing experience, job exploration experiences, work experiences in community-based classroom settings, um, opportunities for accessing community or government services. All of these things um, require kind of an interdisciplinary approach. And transportation is embedded in each of these. Um, so in rural settings, the, the realities are that um, different from in urban settings, there may be less fixed route options. You know, the, the bus doesn't come every 10 minutes in a rural setting as it does in Boston. That you may not even have a train system. So there's less direct fixed route. Fixed route is um, a bus that comes on a regular schedule, a train that goes on a regular schedule. So in rural settings, there's probably less opportunities for these fixed route options. There's also um, travel times, because distance in rural settings are farther apart. There's increased time that um, people spend and students spend on vehicles and getting from point A to point B. Also, I think about the unpredictability of the terrain. You know, some of the, um, the roadways and highways and even the path of travel, the, the path that an individual would take to get to a bus are less developed than they would be in an urban area. Weather conditions may um, impact upon rural transit. And also there may be limitations in technology. You know, maybe bandwidth or communication signals for GPS and other technology is not as prevalent in rural settings. And then also, um, and this I hear a lot from rural transit providers, is there's a lot of policy implications about crossing county lines. And so a bus operator may be able to go to county X, but they can't go any further. And if a student or a passenger lives in County Y, there needs to be some system for ensuring that the person gets to that border. So the realities of, of rural transit are, are real. And I, when I was um, preparing for this workshop, I found right in your own back door really rich uh, resources regarding transportation, specifically rural transportation. And in fact, there was a conference that transpired last April, and it was by the Research and Training Center on Disability in Rural Communities, which um, hosted a state of the science conference. And the major takeaways from this is that, that rural areas and central cities have more in common than not, than an urban, an urban area is defined as kind of uh, the perimeter around the central city. But when I think about a rural area and I think about a central city, you know, the infrastructures may not be as great. The flow patterns because of traffic may not be as great in both a rural or central. Um, and the researchers at this conference suggested that we really think about differences between the lack of convenience to transportation versus the lack of accessibility. And it, is it that the ex transportation mode is inaccessible, or is it just less convenient? And the Tom Seekins from the university pointed out that rural communities have culture of independence and self-help, and that rural communities really are kind of self-helpers and problem solvers. And so some of the transportation solutions that we've seen in rural areas really are, are homegrown. They really come from the people and the communities in which the transit issue occurs. And Tom suggests that we should think of 
not be so disparate in our rural versus urban when we're thinking about transit that we think of a regional approach to mobility and to um, transportation. And I encourage you, you have these slides. Um, I didn't include the URL, but I'm sure that you can Google it because there were a lot of really other neat resources that came as a result of this uh, forum. So here are some of the strategies that we've learned and um, used in, in school settings and beyond school settings. There are a lot of opportunities for blending of funding resources for transit. Um, the Federal Transit Administration encourages use of not only transportation dollars to fund transportation infrastructures, but through matching programs they encourage the um, provision of funding from other sectors. So communities, rural communities have been really creative. I worked with a rural community in Florida that um, used Federal Transit Administration dollars and IDEA money that they had gotten from the state to build a travel instruction program. So uh, blending resources like that, obviously every funder's funding source has its own stipulations, but I know in the federal transit world there's an encouragement to share and blend resources. They also have been really creative regarding the kinds of services that have been provided and they use a lot of different kinds of providers so it's not only a a bus or a train system. They've used churches. Churches are a big transportation provider in rural areas. Think about it. If a church has vans that they have and the vans aren't being used Monday through Saturday, why not use those to transport students to after-school jobs or community-based experiences? And in the western part of Massachusetts here, which is a pretty rural area, they've developed a van sharing program where the school systems and human service organizations like Goodwill, like United Way, have gotten together to purchase a van and they share it, much like a service called Zipcar. I don't know if you're aware of that kind of service, but where you, you rent a car by the hour or um, as you need it. And that's what they've developed in this rural area of Massachusetts. There's also transportation voucher programs where different funding sources would provide an individual or a student a voucher and then they then could use a transportation mode of their choice. Taxi cab programs are big in rural area where taxi cabs are used even to transport students and IDEA monies have paid for that transportation mode if there's no other modes available. Ride sharing programs um, and I know in um, New York City public schools they were using the yellow school buses to transport senior citizens to medical appointments. And I, uh, that sometimes creates some questions about having students ride with seniors and vice versa, but in rural communities especially, we've seen these creative approaches to transportation. There's also a lot of volunteer driver programs where um, uh, retirees or um, individuals who just want to kind of be participant in transportation in your communities, volunteer to be drivers. Um, there's also something called human service transportation coordination. I've seen, and, and human service transportation coordination is um, a big, big issue with the Federal Transit Administration that it doesn't make sense. It's not cost effective for a van that's driving a senior citizen or an older adult to a medical appointment to be going down the same street as a someone that's going to a job on a van service or a student who's going to an employment experience. I've heard that in some communities there's three vans going down the street carrying one passenger. And so the notion of human service transportation is built on the premise that it's more efficient to coordinate and, and share resources around transportation. And then obviously one of the biggest um, things that we see is teaching people to travel independently and the use of travel instruction. So um, this is, you know, of response to intervention, a multi-tiered model of support and the same if you think about transportation services in a school or your community, 
think about it in the same way as you might think about an RTI model, response to intervention model. At the bottom level is a district-wide approach and students, you know, uh, there's a, um, not a non-specified services provided, they're general, it's less intense, it's less costly, and I've provided some examples of what we've seen, how that occurs. And then when you move up the triangle, it becomes the services around transportation become more customized, they become more specific to the unique needs of an individual, it becomes more time intense, becomes more expensive. And then at the top is travel training and paratransit eligibility determination, which are very, very individualized, more costly, um, very unique to the needs of an individual. So this is just a way to organize the work that you're doing around transportation in your community. And um, it, I want to leave time for discussion, but um, think about when I talked about the resource mapping exercise that a school district we had worked with had done, what they did is they looked at that model, so they looked at that triangle, and they thought, hmm, what are we doing at that general level, at that first tier? What are we doing? What could we be doing? And then what, at, what kind of resources do we need to make that happen? And they, went, they used that model to um, just think about what's already in place, what can we be doing, and what do we need to make it happen. So on our website, you can download this product, it's a product and it's free, and you can sit with a group of colleagues, sit with a community, hold a community forum, and go through that, each of those steps and think about, you know, where, what are you doing and what could you be doing. Just another way to think about the work. I mentioned person-directed mobility management or coordinated transportation systems, and I, I won't read this definition, but um, mobility management is very, very prevalent in communities around the country. I don't know if your community, your state has a coordinated effort, coordinated transportation effort, but it's called mobility management. And, and so just what it means is a way to coordinate and um, uh, make resources around transportation more efficient. And so in many communities, there's a job title called a mobility manager. And this person would work with the various populations of people that need rides. So it could be students, it could be um, people going to medical appointments, it could be returning military, it could be older, older adults. And so the mobility manager would know all of the transportation resources in the community and help align those resources with the needs of the various audiences in that community. And I encourage you um, to, to find out whether there's a coordinated transportation plan and whether there's a coordinated transportation system in your community because it's an opportunity for you to leverage transportation resources. I always say participate. Um, the, the story that I relayed about the Texas school district that sat in on the coordinated planning effort in her community and then the transit agencies changing the bus route is an example of how powerful that we could be. And when I look at the mobility management efforts and the coordinated transportation efforts going around a country and I look to see whether education is involved, they're typically not. Educators are not at the table. School systems are not at the table. Families are rarely at the table. So I just encourage you to, to learn whether these opportunities do exist within your communities and um, take advantage of them. Has any, have any of you ever heard of the coordinated transportation system in your community or are you a participant in any of these community committees? And the poll should be open on your screen with a yes, no, or I'm not sure response available to you. And they may be called something different. Um, the Federal Transit Administration calls them coordinated transportation systems or mobility management, but your community might call it something different. But it's just a way to um, kind of synthesize or coordinate all of the transportation resources that may be available across populations. 
We have 57% of the votes in. And so far, we're running at 8% yes, they are involved, 92% no, and 0% are not sure. Hmm. Good. Well, that's uh, that's good enough for the numbers that are involved. That's terrific. And you know, I hope for those of you who are not sure or um, are not involved that you think about getting involved in those efforts very quickly. Travel instruction. I mentioned before that I got a lot of calls from school districts saying, you know, we're just going to have. Uncle Jerry teach students in our school district about travel instruction. Well, travel instruction is a professional role. It's a professional discipline, just like a special educator, a transition coordinator is, a occupational therapist is. And there's a national association, the Association on Travel Instruction, and I have the URL here, and they define travel instruction. And it's an array or continuum of family of services. And it allows people who need assistance, so it's a, across a range of individuals with disabilities, seniors, others, um, to increase their mobility and to increase their use of public transit and their ability to travel independently. Are any of you involved, and I know some of you previous had said that you were involved in travel instruction, are any of you travel trainers yourself or travel instructors yourselves or do you typically refer um, students to other organizations who do the travel instruction? I found some um, in some states the state educational agency um, has direction and policies around travel instruction. And so school districts routinely will offer it. But in other places, I found that there is no state policy. And whether school districts implement travel instruction, it's very random. Okay, about 10 more seconds. So if you haven't voted, your, your um, answer there, I guess it's not a vote, it's a poll. Okay, Judy, it looks like we have 11% saying, I implement travel instruction services, 33% saying, I refer students to organizations for travel instruction, and 56% have never really considered travel instruction services. Hmm. Well, in, um, what's interesting in Massachusetts, the Human Service Transportation Office, which is an office of our state Department of Transportation, has really recognized how important travel instruction is for school-age students. And so they're building a map of the travel instruction services across school districts as well as other human service organizations in the community as a way to help people see where the gaps are, where the needs are. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that, and that, that effort by the state Department of Transportation here in Massachusetts has been a real impetus for school districts to consider offering travel instruction. Or if they don't offer it, maybe collaborating with another school district um, to do so. Some of our intermediate units, um, I know in Pennsylvania, intermediate units um, provide travel instruction to school districts in geographically different areas across the state. And so that may be something that you all could work with your state department or your intermediate unit or your service agency on developing capacity to implement travel instruction. We do have a couple of comments that came in about travel instruction. Do you want me to read those now or do you want to wait? Please. Yeah, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, one, this is a parent who says, I created my own travel instruction. I would have liked a curriculum and training. And then the same parent um, said that when you described the curriculum earlier that it sounded fabulous and they wished that they would have had access to it. And um, then this person says, my son's transition program only uses public transportation, no school van, to get out into the community. They also do extensive travel training during classroom time. There is also travel instruction provided by the local public bus system. 
the biggest concern for me is not knowing how well public bus drivers are trained in working with people with special needs and those who might need additional assistance. Hmm. Well, um, first, thanks for the um, kind words about the curriculum. It's nice to hear. And boy, you're this, the commenter that indicated that travel instruction is part of the student's curriculum and there is travel instruction is, wow, you're in a, a great school district and should be a model for others. Um, your concerns about bus drivers and their knowledge of students and people with disabilities is, you know, really valid. And the, obviously the Americans with Disabilities Act legally requires transit agencies to provide um, services to people with disabilities. And so as part of that, transit agencies, and, and I don't know of a transit agency that doesn't, offers professional development and training to drivers about how to interact with people with disabilities on their whatever mode of transportation it is. Um, I know that transit agencies take that really seriously. Customer service is a big deal to them, and they get evaluated by the Federal Transit Administration. So having bus drivers, having train operators have the knowledge to work with a diverse range of riders is really important. Um, and um, there are, I mean, that's not to say that across the board you're going to get a driver that's going to understand the needs of people with disabilities. Um, there's going to be, obviously, bad drivers out there. but. When we have to teach students part of the self-advocacy work that we do, and you'll, you can find on our website some self-advocacy materials that we developed in cooperation with the Autism Research Institute and Dr. Valerie Paradis, where we have students develop, develop self-advocacy plans. And part of that plan is, what do you do if a driver is unresponsive to you? What do you do if a driver um, does not respect you as a person with a disability or a student with a disability. So, you know, we, part of the curriculum is teaching students how to be self-advocates um, and knowing what to do. If that situation occurs, what's the recourse for that student so they can ensure that the transit agency, you know, does take action against that driver. But um, certainly it's a, it's a real concern, but we have materials, if, um, which one of the um, products on Easter Seals Project Action website is a tool that helps transit operators work with people with disabilities. And I've had, we could, we could send you multiple copies and what you could do is put it in the hands of drivers. You know, to actually have your students, have your children bring it to a driver, leave it on the front you know, the front of a bus so that the driver sees it. But really, transit agencies, um, I, I think, from what I understand, is have been pretty good about providing professional development to drivers. Um, these are just some definitions of travel instruction. It's a multi-tiered process. And I've had school districts say, oh, yeah, we provide travel training to students and what they say is that they have students sitting in a classroom watching a movie about riding a bus. That's not travel instruction. That's not travel training. So travel instruction has multi multiple tiers. And the, the first is orientation, which is providing an overview of transit. Travel familiarization is where you may take a group of students. And so an educator may take a group of students and use a public bus. And that's travel familiarization. Travel training is the more intense, the more one-on-one, -on -one, the more customized, really um, respects the um, in needs of a rider and the kinds of needs that the rider has about using public transit. And it either could be for riders who previously have used public transit and for whatever reason are no longer able to use it in a traditional way and need to be retrained, or the other um, population for travel training is for our students, for right? students who have never used a public public bus. Um, I just shared this slide with you because I wanted you to be aware of how important competencies for travel trainers are, 
we have a product on the website that you can bring into your school districts um, and it gives some suggestions and considerations for hiring a travel trainer. But don't let Uncle Jerry be the travel trainer for a school district. Ensure that, school, that your school district or if you're a family member and have interactions about this with school district, ensure that they're hiring competent travel trainers to do the work. Um, in the phases of travel training that we, we offer a workshop on travel training, these are the, the five steps of travel training. And it's uh, the assessment piece, planning for a trip, looking at the path of travel, so not only riding the bus, but getting to the bus. How, what are the obstacles in a way, and, and for rural areas this becomes important, that the path of travel is a pretty long way in rural areas for students. And then we teach deboarding and boarding and then riding the bus. Um, become involved. These are just some strategies for ways that you can become involved in transportation efforts in your community. Writing products, developing materials. You, know, you all are experts in, in your fields and in your perspectives. And transit agencies don't have the expertise that you all have. So, you know, look for opportunities to engage with them and offer your perspectives, offer your expertise. And here are some more um, things that we've learned on a national project that we're learning. I provide them that we offer. There's a URL. And I went very long, and I apologize for that. But I um, would love to pick your brain and, and share any ideas, any suggestions that you have. If you think, I uh, thank you for the comment about this material being worthwhile. I hope that I've given you kind of an, a teaser and hope you go to our website and join our listservs and um, to be able to get access information from Project Action on an ongoing basis and use our materials. So um, thank you for letting me speak with you today. I'd be very open to hearing any of your ideas. So if you have questions or comments or ideas to share with Judy, go ahead and type those into the chat box. Um, don't disappear from the webinar. She has a few final thoughts for you, and we have some housekeeping information at the end, so please do stick with us. Um, we have one comment that's come in, and it says, great, thank you for this info. I'll check out the self-advocacy information. Great. Any other questions or comments from folks? We'll give you a minute to type those in. One thing that I failed to mention, we have a lot of online communities, and um, one in particular is the Accessible Transportation for Students online community, and it's free, and you can participate, and you could share ideas with other family members, with educators, and it's just a real informal online forum to sharing resources. And one comment that just came in that's a, a really important one, I think, it's just a reminder that a lot of educators are not back in their, in their classrooms yet or back at their desks yet, and so they may not be participating on today's conference call or today's webinar, but this session has been recorded. It will be posted to the Rural Institute Transition and Employment Projects website and to the Rural Institute Pluck Online Transition Toolbox, and both of those URLs should be in your chat box. Um, so, and it usually takes about two weeks for us to get the recordings posted. So if you listened to Judy's information today and you think, wow, this is really something that the educators in my school district need to hear, pass the link on to them and invite them to listen to it when they have an opportunity. Yeah, that's exactly right. My, my dream for the curriculum would be a group of educators and families and pupil transporters sitting around and just going through the content and talking about it and participating in some of the activities that we've developed because I think that to share it is one thing, but actually engage and do it is another. So I hope that those of you who participated today will really be catalysts for, for those around you to think about how this can be applied in your own setting. Um, and we did just have uh, another comment come in. Excellent. Thank you for the important work. 
how does one get trained and to become certified? A teacher, another professional? It, um, certified as a travel trainer? I guess that's what the reference was to. Oh, yes. Yeah. So right now there is not a national certification process for travel trainers. The Association of Travel Instruction, which I share the URL, has this set of competencies and we encourage um, school districts and others as they're hiring travel trainers to make sure that the person has those competencies and is active in the Association for Travel Instruction. There are many organizations that provide train-the-trainer models. We do. We have workshops. If you go to our website, we provide travel training around the country, you know, like a train-the-trainer session. There are other nonprofit organizations that provide train-the-trainer travel instructions. I know some Easter Seals affiliates in some communities do, human service organizations in some communities do. There are some private for-profit companies do, so I guess just kind of be on the lookout for, for those kinds of organizations. I'm not suggesting that they're not good, but there are organizations that provide free or low-cost um, training as opposed to a for-profit organization. I know of also some transit organizations that provide train-the-trainer models. Travel instruction can come from such an array of places. Some transit agencies, um, there's a transit agency in Ohio we've been working with, they provide amazing travel instruction services. And in other communities, the transit agency does not offer anything around travel training. So um, I guess the best way you can contact us, you could call our toll-free number, and we could do a search for you to find out whether there's any local or community or even geographically close places to you that would provide the service. You can participate in one of our free workshops. The, the dates are all included on our website. Um, but we also could refer you probably to other organizations that might. And it's funny, I just got back from the National Conference of the Association of Travel Instructors and every year the numbers of participants in that meeting grows and it's really exciting. And it's really exciting to see that this is a, a really important and valid profession. Um, and that it's part of an IEP team, that it's critical to student post-school success. That's the exciting thing. We haven't received any more questions, Judy, just a number of comments thanking you for the fantastic information and saying that the webinar was very well done and that they're very appreciative of what you have shared today. So if you have any final slides, any final comments that you want to do, um, then I will do our, our housekeeping closing information and we'll let folks go for the afternoon. Sure. Um, let's see. Just I think in the last couple slides I included some resources. It's not, again, it's not moving. And I don't know if that's because this, but um, some of the resources that I've mentioned um, during this presentation are included in the slides and then my contact information are just the last the last slides. Um, I welcome any of your follow-up. If something comes to mind after you get off this webinar, please send me an email. My contact information is there. I would love to be in touch with you and I hope you all take advantage of the really great resources that we produce. And again, I, I thank um, Kim and Ellen at the Rural Institute, and I thank all of you for participating in this presentation. I've enjoyed it. So, Kim, I'm done. Okay, thank you. And you might try sometimes double clicking a couple of times will un unfreeze your screen if you want to try and get to your contact slide. Okay. Maybe maybe it's just tired and ready to be done. I think so. Just like me, right after my <laughs> move. <laughs> So for my closing remarks, just a reminder that when you sign off of the webinar today, a short survey will pop up. Take the time to complete that survey. Value the information. We use that feedback to design our upcoming webinars and also to improve the services that we are offering. So please take the time to do that. Our next webinar will be Home Sweet Home, Housing Options for Young Adults with Disabilities. And that will take place on Tuesday, September 17th from 1 until 2.30 on Mountain Time. And the flyers for that will be going out in a couple of weeks 
to listserv members. So mark your calendars for September 17th. A reminder that the recording from today's session will be posted to the Transition and Employment Project's website and also to the Rural Institute PLUC online trans transition toolbox site. And those URLs should be up in your chat window. We really want to thank all of you who took the time on this August afternoon to participate in the webinar. We know that you have lots of other things that you probably um, need to do or would prefer to do in the summertime, and we find it really wonderful that you um, see this as an important enough topic that you took the time to be here today. So thank you. And a, a very special thanks to Judy. We were thrilled that she was willing to come and present and bring her national expertise to us in Montana. We were especially thrilled when we learned that she was willing to do this um, 15 minutes after a, a move to another city. So um, thank you, Judy, for following through and for being here and for being engaged and alive and active and for all of, all of the fabulous information that you've shared. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.